We want to tell you how pleased we are to have you here, how much we admire you, and how much we appreciate your presence here. I have to admit that in coming up the elevator that brought me to this room, if I were to be asked what I expected to find, I wouldn't have known what to answer. I knew that a few people were in meant to come who were so kind to come here to listen to me, but if I had been told that I would hear the speech of President Iglesias that we just heard, I would have said that's impossible. And it's impossible. Why? Because I'm in a bank. The banks have a language well known to all of us, unfortunately much too familiar to all of us. And for me, to come into a bank as imposing as this bank is, that one can see as one walks in, which is rather intimidating, I must say, and to then listen to words that could have been said, I won't say by a political leaders, because leaders, political leaders can say anything, but by someone, and I have to acknowledge that this someone is President Iglesias himself and probably half of the bank, words that could have been said in entirely different circumstances and with different for a different purpose, because we would have been debating things having to do with each of our lives and the, the lives of all of us. And since we're used to the idea that a bank doesn't have a soul, Although I have to confess that today, because I had to cash a check, I walked into a bank here in Washington, and I, not there, I never saw anything that looked more like a church. The clerks, very serious and expressionless, but at the same time, as if they held divine wisdom in their hands. So to come here, and now let's go straight to the heart of the matter, to come in here and to listen to those words, I have to say though, watch out, because I'm going to remind you of those words for the rest of your life. Because it's not enough just to say them. Mind you, saying them is already quite a bit. Having said them, though, commits you. And with this many witnesses, nobody can say that I'm not telling the truth because I will call all of those here to bear witness. So I will be attentive to what this bank and what you personally do henceforth. <gasps> On the other hand, when I come to something like this, I'm never quite sure what it is I'm going to say. So I'm waiting for something to happen either outside of the elevator or inside the elevator that gives me an idea. And I say, OK, this is, going to, this is what I'm going to use. A great deal has been said of a literature called a literature of evasion. Those books that we buy and read to relax and think of something other to entertain, to leave where we currently are. That doesn't mean that it's uh, they're not good books. They're excellent books that are intended to do precisely that. And even those authors exist and write. But no nothing has ever been said of a literature that I would call of invasion a literature of invasion. We talk about a literature of evasion, but never of invasion. 
on the one hand, we have a literature that makes us leave and another one that brings us in. I don't want to speak too much about myself, but I don't remember that this has ever happened. And mind you, I'm not casting any judgments of value or any opinion as to the relative quality of the different types of books. But I really don't think I've ever written any sort of literature of evasion. And I had never understood until today that if there is any uh, designation that we could use to describe what I write, and I say this for the first time because this is the first time the thought has occurred to me, this would be a literature of invasion. A literature of invasion that has more or less expressed itself throughout my writing career, whether in articles in the newspapers, in essays, or in the theater, and of course in the novels. Before I go on to say what I'm intended to say, since I've mentioned the theater, let me mention briefly a theater piece that I wrote on which an opera was based. What takes place in that play happened in a university in northern Germany in the middle of the 16th century. 19, 1530, something like that. That was the period of the major religious conflicts in Europe. Therefore, Lutheranism, Catholicism, it's the time of Charles V that is mentioned so often nowadays. And in the Protestants were Baptists because they believed that baptism could only be given at a mature age, but if not mature, at least at an age when the individual could say, yes, I want to be baptized, as compared to the Catholics who baptize immediately. The result was that the city was encircled by Catholic troops in a siege that, da that uh, lasted about 14 months. The city originally had about 13 or 14,000 inhabitants, and at the end of the siege there were slightly over 2,000. All the others had been burnt or beheaded. It's the old story of intolerance, which has, which pursues, and that we can't quite get rid of. This really is connected to the literature of invasion, more so that in the case of this work, which is called In the Name of God, In Nomine Dei, and it places or will place God, assuming that he exists, I mean, I don't believe it, but but he's, I don't even believe he exists, but I do think he's a pretty good person. This is going to place a God uh, with a, uh, before a very difficult situation, because at the day of the final judgment, if that ever comes about, billions of people will come to stand before God, but the Catholics and the uh, Baptist Protestants will also come before God to be judged. Now, the delicate issue that God is going to have to settle is what does he do with them? Does he welcome the Catholics and sends the Protestants to hell? He, he can't do that. He can't do that because the Protestants also believe in him and they even sacrifice their lives for him. Does he welcome the Protestants who sends the Catholics to hell? No, of course not. So human stupidity, and of course we have known this for many years, but the human stupidity is of such magnitude that in the case that God exists, there can only be one God. There can only be one God. 
we kill each other off because of God without realizing that on the one hand that the most absurd of all the wars are the religious wars. That's the most absurd one, the one that shouldn't absolutely ever occur. On the other hand, it seems that we don't notice that to kill in the name of God makes turns God into an assassin, which is unthinkable. God couldn't possibly be that. If I made this comment on this play is to insist on the question, in talking about the literature of inflation, I want to say that once I concern myself, even though President Iglesias said that the bank is concerned, but I want to tell him that, that nobody in the world is more concerned than I am. But that means that that means that I would be an excellent advisor to the bank because the bank has so many concerns and I could add my own concerns to that and then I would see how far we could take all these concerns. This idea that the world isn't doing well, on the contrary, it's doing pretty badly and that this world is a disaster is something that pursues me almost obsessively. And I've already been asked, why do I worry so much? And they say, listen, you're healthy. You won the Nobel Prize. You have thousands and thousands, if not millions of leaders, of readers throughout the world that are very interested in reading what you write. You're happily married. You have a wife that you like, and you have reasons to believe that she likes you as well. And on top of that, you have three dogs. You have a garden. You live on a beautiful island, Lanzarote, with the sea in front of your house, with the... So why do you, why do you worry? And I said, I think it was yesterday, in the University of New York, I said that when I die, and I sure hope that doesn't happen until I'm 99, if they were to put a headstone wherever my earthly remains are to be buried, to use this euphemism, they could put the following inscription. Here lies José Saramago, <laughs> who is shocked, who is indignant. Why is indignant? For having died, of course. But also indignant for many other things that worry him wha worried him while he was alive. And what worries him is the world that we live in. It, it just so happens that after I wrote the gospel according to Jesus Christ, which is the reason that uh, Pilar and myself live in Lanzarote, even though the real responsible is the Portuguese government, who at the time censured the book. I don't know whether that made any sense or not. I don't think it does. This was Before the revolution, we had to put up precisely with this, the dictatorship and fas fascism and censorship and the police and prison. All of that that we had to put up for 48 years, we didn't expect that in the middle of our so-called democracy, censorship like that could take place. And the uh, book wasn't taken out of the bookstores, but I wasn't allowed to, it wasn't a candidate to a European prize, and it had been selected by many cultural institutions supposedly institutions that knew what they were talking about. So the government forbid that and didn't allow us to participate for this prize. Since I won't only be indignant after dying because I was indignant before I died, that indignation that I expressed in several ways is what led me to leave uh, Portuguese. It's not that I broke with my country, my country's my country, but that's the way I found to protest by moving elsewhere. Now, I said 
that after the gospel according to Jesus Christ that was harshly criticized, the Vatican called me every possible name, and there's no law that prevents them or punishment punishes them. They can call me anything they want. But after the gospel according to Jesus Christ, something happened in my life. There's no difference between what I have been doing over time, and this happened in 1993, 94, along more or less then. I wrote a book called Blindness. In English, it's one of the few words that I know how to say, blindness. <laughs> and it's been published here. And this is a book that I imagine there are a few here who have read it, that be begins saying very clearly, but at the same time telling to a literary genre, which isn't quite uh, commonly used today, which is the allegory, and it might be worthwhile saying something about that. The allegory and the heroic times with the, the literary use of allegories, which was also used in painting and in sculpture in the 17th century or even in the 18th century, in the 19th century, it, was, it had become sort of a degenerative form of allegory, but apparently there doesn't seem to be any need for this after structuralism, realism, uh, er, all those isms that uh, we now have, and let's not forget romanticism. Apparently, the, the realistic description of what we call reality was what I used. But I think what I believe is that people quickly lose their focus. The attention span is short. They can't stay focused on a topic and in a way of listening to it. They get tired of discussing it. We can see this in the way one looks at a painting or looks at a sculpture or le reads a book or listens to a musical composition. So without having thought about it beforehand, this is something that came to me naturally, blindness is an allegory. As you know, those of you who have read it and those of you who haven't, you're now going to have many reasons to run to the bookstore and buy it to see to what extent the book concerns the concerns of the author that has already more or less expressed them here. The book tells an absurd story. As absurd as is, for instance, my romance, The Stone Raft, where I break the Iberian Peninsula from Europe and I turn this peninsula into a raft that is navigating without sinking. It uh, goes by the Azores and it turns towards the South Atlantic. And that is also a metaphor. This book at the time was seen as a protest against Europe's and Spain's integration or into the European community. There is a bit of that, a bit of truth in that. I have to recognize it. This book is, among other things, the result of a personal and historic resentment. Personal resentment, why? Because historical resentment leads to personal resentments. Historical resentment in the following sense. As we know, until very recently, it's not worth while thinking when exactly, but until very recently, Europe, as far as, as those who at the time were already considered Europeans, ended in the Pyrenees. Everything beyond the Pyrenees was something picturesque and sort of vague. Were there bullfights? They also have them in southern France, but where people sing the fado, and where it becomes very close to the Africa. And 
So after so many centuries, after the year of the discoveries had, pat had uh, w left us many years when we had such good uh, navigation techniques, uh, the, the Spanish too, but we were a bit better at it than the Spanish were. After that, we entered a period of decadence. And we were, in fact, those that even after joining the EU were considered the apprentices. So as a result of the, this was the result of a personal historical resent resentment. As if to say, you don't like us? OK, we're leaving. But I remember a cri criticism by a politician who wasn't even a literary critic who said, what this man is telling us isn't what it appears to be at first blush. What he's saying is that he would like the Iberian Peninsula to become the engine to pull all of Europe to the south. If we were to think of this, we could say, what would it mean to pull Europe to the south? Uh, the reviewer is right, because I was concerned about this book, thinking that it meant that. But his review really uh, clarified my thoughts. I think he was in this following sense, which is very clear. I think Europe owes something to the south. And by south here, I mean something that is not totally geographic, not the southern half of the earth. South uh, sometimes gets into the northern part of uh, earth, really. Uh, but what uh, the rich Europe owes to the south is part of the wealth of Europe, because this wealth was uh, taken from, and that's the mildest way I can put it, was taken from the south. So therefore, this uh, trip of Europe towards the south had another meaning. One meaning was, of course, to uh, to uh, to give back what uh, had been taken, the goods, the wealth that had been taken. The British Museum, for instance, has a great collection of art from the Parthenon and Athens, and apparently the British uh, Museum is not ready to um, return those works to Greece. Therefore, we're talking about returning these uh, objects, I mean the objects that have been the objects that have been taken or uh, stolen or whatever you want to talk about. Uh, we could also talk about Africa. I'm not a technician, I'm just a citizen, a writer. But uh, in my opinion, uh, the problem of Africa cannot be solved without a very simple thing that uh, everybody deals with e economics and finance um, understand it. It's a verb. The verb is to invest. Uh, it's not worth thinking that we could resolve the problem in Africa without doing now what the uh, colonial powers did not do in the past. Uh, to the island of Lanzarote, where I live, every day Many Africans land, many die before getting to land. Uh, Nigerians, Senegalese, Sierra Leoneans, people who come from Africa and cross the Mediterranean. There are hundreds of cadavers in the Mediterranean, dead bodies. Uh, some people say that in Spain we eat the fish who ate the bodies of the Africans who drowned in the Mediterranean. It's a piece of black humor, but this is true, too, because, well, countries eat whatever they can eat, and fish do it, too, and a uh, dead body uh, is good food for fish. And I think that I've spoken enough to show why, all the reasons why I should be president of this bank instead of president Ecclesias. But anyway, all these I ideas led me to write blindness. Uh, you know the story. You know that all the inhabitants of a country, of a city, or the world become blind in a very few days. Everyone, everyone becomes blind. That's the story. 
It is a strange kind of blindness. It's a white blindness.